Good morning, greetings, and God bless. I'm Pastor Jeff. This is your first time tuning in to the Disciple Factory. I welcome you this morning. It is Sunday, August 23rd. I'm sorry if I'm a little out of breath. I've been running around this morning trying to get some chores done and set up this broadcast. Uh, just doing a whole lot of work this morning and really stretching myself today. So, um, Anyway, I want to welcome you to our live stream message this morning. I uh, hope you're uh, having a blessed morning so far. Uh, I would like to uh, share some prayer requests with you, and then we'll get started on uh, today's message, all right? Uh, this morning, uh, it's especially on my heart for uh, Trisha's grandson. Uh, I know she brought it uh, to everybody's attention last night uh, in regards to the safety of her grandson and her son and daughter-in-law having favor in regards to her grandson. So we pray that you'll lift that whole situation up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also for my daughter, Paige Kessinger, uh, she's been having severe headaches as a result of a cyst that's on her brain. She is going back for an annual test uh, here in the next month to confirm that if it's growing or not. So we're praying that it's not growing and that we're not seeing any change in that cyst because that's what's creating all these headaches and whatnot so we're just praying in regards to that situation i want to lift up my brother and sister-in-law uh barry and belina noble uh they were just diagnosed with covid 19 uh the day before yesterday uh barry's been down for a whole week sick real hard and now belina's uh got a temperature and she's not feeling so well so we just pray that you'll lift them up uh also my wife's aunt tan uh she had uh it looks like possible seizures uh, so just lift her up. She was released from the hospital and part of the problem is that she's not drinking enough and she lives out in Arizona where the temperatures have been up in the hundreds, 104, right around that area. So uh, lift her up. Uh, also for Jennifer Wiggins, her great grandmother passed away this past Tuesday. Also want to lift up Jerry Fuller. Uh, he lost his wife here about a week and a half ago. She passed away, so lift him up as he's going through the mourning of his wife. Uh, both very good people. Uh, Jerry's like one of my closest brothers, so I just I pray and lift him up that God would encourage him and strengthen him. Uh, also, want to lift up Nick Kirkpatrick, who fractured his pinky finger, and his forearm is in a cast. So uh, pray for him. Uh, also, want to lift up my stepsister, uh, Angel Halo, as she's called on Facebook, but her real name is Marshall. Uh, praying for her foot. She uh, was helping a friend move this past week and a heavy butcher block table fell on her foot the other day. Uh, and the swelling has finally started to come down, but it still hurts real bad, so lift her in prayer. Also want to lift up Joellen Moore and her family, also good friends of Tina and I. Uh, her mom, uh, Joyce, passed away this past week and they buried her on Friday, so Pray God wraps his loving arms around them, comforts them, and, uh, and, uh, and loves on them, all right? Also want to uh, bring up a yay God this morning, uh, a praise report. Oh, look at there. There's my puppy. Come here, Lola Bear. Hi, Loli. Hi. All right. Go, go, go. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen with a live stream message, uh, what's going to happen. So my God, or my uh, fur, pu fur puppy's coming in the door. So uh, anyway, uh yeah, God, uh, Nick Kirkpatrick, uh, as a result of fracturing his, his pinky finger, whichever, uh, he didn't have to have surgery, so praise God for that. And he also, he was reunited with his dad uh, this past week, so yeah, God for that. Uh, some additional announcements I'd like to bring to everybody's attention. Yes, we are open. We are open Tuesday nights at 6 o'clock with music, a message, food, and a fellowship. So. Everybody's welcome. Come on down to the Disciple Factory Cafe and hang out with us and praise God and just have a good time and getting fed. All right. Amen. God is good that we are finally open. Uh, well, the only thing we ask is that you wear a, a face mask when you come in. So uh, it's a small price to pay to just be able to come together and fellowship as one and having a good time. And if you don't have a face mask, one will be provided for you free of charge. Amen. Uh, the Disciple Factory is also looking for Christian acoustic guitar players and vocalists that would be interested in volunteering their gifts and their talents to play a set of three to six songs for the Disciple Factory Outreach Ministries on Tuesday nights. 
So we're lining up music for the remainder of August and September. And if you're interested, you can give Pastor Critter a call or you can call myself or stop in on Tuesday nights and see us. And uh, we'll hook up and see what we can do to get you set up. Amen. We'd also encourage you to share and support these live stream broadcasts. Share them with your friends, your family, your co-workers, and those in your community. You know, get the word out there a bit. We're open on Tuesday nights, and we're also doing live stream messages on Sunday mornings. Amen? I'm going to turn my birds down back here a little bit, so if you don't mind. There we go. <laughs> I love to listen to the, the sounds of the outdoors. Um, also, with these live stream messages, show us some love. Show us some emojis here in the comments below on, the, on these live streams. Let us know you're out there and that you miss us, that we miss you. So show us some love, show us some emojis, give us some thumbs up or whatever the case may be. And also leave us some comments if you have some prayer requests or some yay gods. Share those with us in the comments below. Uh, that way we know that you're tuning in, you're watching these, uh, and that you're being blessed. Amen. Uh, also, uh, we currently have a women's Bible study that's in play. Uh, Tricia is leading that, so if you're interested in that, uh, give a shout out to uh, Tricia or reach out to Pastor Critter or myself and we'll hook you up with her so that you can become part of these ladies' Bible studies. It's a, it's a wonderful Bible study from what I'm seeing so far, and I'm, even my wife is even in on this, so praise God for that. Also, the men are uh, getting ready to start up a new Bible study here on September 1st. It's the first Tuesday in September uh, at 7 o'clock. We'll be, I'll be sharing about an upcoming Bible study uh, we're going to be covering a book called The Twelve Ordinary Men, and that's the twelve men of the disciples, the twelve disciples in the Bible. Amen. Uh, also, tithes and offerings. You know, I kind of covered on that last week, and I shared about that last week. I want to encourage you to support the Disciple Factory through your tithes and offerings. Uh, you can mail in a check to us at 50 South 30th Street in North Ohio and, and you know write it out to the Disciple Factory. Or you can also come in on Tuesday nights and put a draw offering in the uh, offering box at the back of the cafe by uh, where the food is served. So uh, help to support the Disciple Factory and all the outreaches for this community. Amen. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to open in prayer and lift up all these prayer petitions. And give thanks for all that, that God's doing for us. Amen. Oh, Father God, help slow me down and calm me to be able to share your word this morning, Father God. I've been running around like a chicken with my head cut off when we need to just slow our roll and get tuned in with you. And I just thank you, Lord, that we can take these opportunities, these moments to come before you and humble ourselves and just get tuned in to your Holy Spirit and hear what your word would have to say to us. Father God, with that being said, I want to lift up all the prayers and petitions this morning, Father, that I, I, I mentioned today. Uh, I want to lift up Trisha's grandson, her son, and, her, and their daughter-in-law, that you'd give them favor in regards to that situation with the grandson. Lifting up Nick for a quick healing and recovery. Uh, lifting up my brother Jerry, that you'd comfort him, and also dwelling in her family. Uh, and I just lift up all these prayer requests unto you, Father God, and just pray that you would touch each and every one of these people. And bless them, Father, beyond measure. And let them know that you are there for them and they can lean on you and call upon you to meet our needs. So we just lift all those up to you this morning, Father. And Father God, I just pray that you use your, allow your Holy Spirit to move through me this morning to share your word, not my word, what I think, Father, but what your word says and that it would not return void that it if it reaches that one person out there that just happens to tune in it is worth it all and i i consider it an honor and a privilege father god to be able to share your word and do the work in sharing the gospel and i thank you for all these things in jesus mighty name amen um, last week i uh, spoke of tithing investing into the kingdom of god and how god is calling us to be good stewards I even shared an example from the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verses 14 30, that shares about the parables of the bags of gold. Jesus shared about that. I want to explore this subject matter a little further from a slightly different perspective, the concept of stewardship and how it applies in the life of the believer. And I want to begin by sharing a story from the Old Testament and how it is 
all relevant and what can be learned from it and how it applies to the believer today. Today's message is titled, Stewardship, Growing Where We're Planted. Let's begin, begin by explaining what's the definition of stewardship it's, as it's in the Bible. In the Bible, stewardship is another way of talking about how you live your life. In the New Testament books, the word steward is rooted in the Greek word oikonomos, which means the manager of a household. In general, to steward <coughs> excuse me, is to manage something on someone's behalf, whether a family member, friend, or an employer who asks you to watch over something, then you're stewarding or managing whatever they entrusted to your care. Biblical stewardship is one of the primary ways Christ calls us to live our life. It's a theme in the Bible you can trace from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And it's a calling rooted in creation, highlighted throughout the Bible, and influences the way you live in your life for the glory of God. Now, according to Wikipedia, a biblical worldview of a stewardship can be consciously defined as utilizing and managing all resources God provides for the glory of God and the betterment of His creation. The central essence of biblical worldview stewardship is managing everything God brings into the believer's life in a manner that honors God and impacts eternity. Excuse me. Stewardship begins and ends with the understanding of God's ownership of all, in other words, Christ created and owns everything. The book says in the book of Revelation 22, 13, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. In Psalms 24, 1, it says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. And then Deuteronomy 10, 14, to the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens and the earth and everything in it. The land, uh, Leviticus 25, 23 says this, The land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine, and you are but aliens and my tenants. And finally, in Job 41, 11, it says, Who has a claim against me that I must pay? Everything under heaven belongs to me. So, I mean, the scripture establishes that everything is owned by God. Everything we have is owned by God. And it's just on loan to us or given to us to use. Amen? With all this being said and establishing ownership here and what stewardship is all about, I want to share from the, uh, the book of Genesis about the story of Joseph. So we're going to start out in the Old Testament and in the book of Genesis, the very first book in the Bible. In chapters 37 through 50. Now we're not going to read all that because of time constraints, but I will kind of give you a Reader's Digest uh, condensed version of the book of Genesis from chapters 37 through 50 about the life of Joseph. Amen. So let me say this. In this one book of the Bible, in 13 chapters, it reads and is comparable to some of the novels or movies that are out there with all the key storylines and the teasers to get you to watch or read. For example, it's about someone who, who was a visionary and was a dreamer. It's about sibling rivalries in a large family. It's about jealousy, scheming, and betrayal. It's about faking someone's death. It's about being sold into slavery. It's a talk, it talks about traveling to foreign lands. It's about sexual overtones and temptations, being accused of a crime they didn't commit, doing time in prison, rising to power, precision, and prestige, and also becoming the second most influential, influential person of power in a great nation, and ultimately saving that nation from a natural disaster. And then, finally, in closing, to wrap it all up, to bring the finish to this overview, a restoration of a divided family, family finding forgiveness and overcoming bitterness. So it reads like, a, like one of the modern-day uh, novels or one of the movies that you watch nowadays. So... Is it relevant? Yes. Uh, is it from the old time, you know, the old testament from a thousand, two thousand years, three thousand years ago? Yes. But you can see the parallels how it can apply to or compare to what's going on in the world today. So let's let's begin. This is the story of Joseph. Now please note the events of Joseph's life that are shared in the Old Testament of the Bible are also found in the Torah and also the Quran. The story of Joseph begins in Canaan, which is modern-day Palestine, Syria, and Israel around 1600-1700 BC. So like I said, it's been about 
Mm, well, in this case, you see, 1,700 years ago plus 2020, we're talking almost three th between three and 4,000 years ago. Joseph was the 11th of 12 sons of a wealthy nomad by the name of Jacob and his second wife, Rachel. His story is told in the book of Genesis, chapters 37 through 50. And it's worth noting that Joseph's father, Jacob, had two wives and two concubines, which created some of the unusual dynamics that affected Joseph's life because of his brothers. Now, Joseph was very much loved by his father, Jacob, because he'd been born to him in his old age. As a matter of fact, he was, uh, by one account, 84 years old. That's how old Jacob was. So, you know, I can't hardly fathom that being 84 years old and starting to grow a family, you know. But because of his age, Jacob, or Joseph, found was that much more special to him. Amen. And as a result, uh, he was given a special gift by his father, which was a richly ornamental, multicolored coat. And this favoritism wasn't well received by his older brothers and prompted feelings of jealousy with his brothers, especially the sons of Jacob's other wife, which was Leah. Those ill feelings grew even more so when Joseph repeated two of his dreams to them in which he was portrayed as ruling over his brother. And well, let me give you a little backstory here. He was given a special gift, which was dreams and visions. And like his father before him, Jacob also had dreams and visions as well. But in this case, Joseph had these dreams and he shared them with his brothers. Now, they didn't paint a, a good picture between him and his brothers. And so therefore, his brothers had some ill feelings towards him. They didn't like him because basically they said they would bow down to him. Uh, basically, it says in the, in the first, brothers were gathering wheeled in the field and the brothers bundles bowed down to Joseph's bundle and then the second Joseph envisioned the sun the moon and the 11 stars now we're talking about the first and second visions or dreams that he shared and this last one symbolized his parents and his brothers bowing down to him and they didn't like his interpretation that he, that he shared with them so when Joseph was 17 the tensions came to a head and one day Jacob his father sent out Joseph to go find his brothers in Shechem where they were tending their sheep. Now, mind you, there's some ill feelings here. There's some bitterness, grew, bitterness that has grown up between uh, Joseph and his, his 11 other siblings. Amen. And uh, so when Joseph went to find them, they could see him coming at a distance and seizing their chance. The brothers threw the unsuspecting Joseph into a pit when he found them. And a short while later, Joseph's brothers spotted an Arab caravan passing the scene, and the brothers sold Joseph to the traders. I can't hardly fathom that. I mean, can you imagine? You're, you're so angry with your brother that you're going to sell him to somebody? Ship him off to some foreign land? I mean, it's just unfathomable. Like, it's, like I said, these, these books read like a modern-day uh, novel, and that... You wouldn't, you wouldn't think these things would actually happen, but here it is. Uh, so while Joseph was being taken to Egypt, his brothers faked his death by rubbing goat's blood into the multicolored coat and giving that to his father, Jacob, and telling him that he's been killed. So, you know, Jacob is mourning, Joseph is being shipped off to Egypt, and the brothers go their merry way because they got rid of their brother. And you can see where I'm going with this? <sighs> So he was eventually, Joseph that is, uh, the traders, the slave traders, took him to Egypt where he was sold to a, one of King Pharaoh's ministers who was Potiphar. And G Joseph, in nah, I'm getting my words mixed up here. I'm having a hard time reading this because I'm still dealing with a little vertigo, so pray for me. In Egypt, Joseph became a house servant to a rich, high-ranking Egyptian, which was Potiphar. And for a while, things started to look up for young Joseph. Divine success enabled him to find favor in his master's eyes, and he was appointed head of Potiphar's estate. To elaborate further, the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in everything he did. Joseph, therefore, found favor in Potiphar's eyes, because even Potiphar could see that the Lord was with Joseph in all that he did. So Potiphar then put Joseph in charge of his household and entrusted to his care everything he owned. 
The Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph, and the blessings of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. However, this wouldn't last for long. For too much longer, now mind you, Potiphar trusted Joseph to a great degree, to the point that he didn't worry about anything. The only thing he worried about was getting fed and, and eating, right? So he'd leave everything to Joseph's care, and he'd go off and do whatever he would do, and leave Joseph there in charge of his household and everything in, in his home and in the fields and so on and so forth. Mind you, Joseph also had a wife that stayed at home there, and she was attracted to this well-built and handsome-looking Hebrew. Potiphar's wife desired to be in it with intimate with him, wanted to sleep with him, and tried to seduce him. And to her surprise and shock, Joseph continually refused. Now, mind you, this went on day after day for many days. It just wasn't one specific incident. It was multiple days. So, however, one day when no one was home other than the two of them, Joseph and Potiphar's wife, the mistress grabbed Joseph's garment and demanded that he consent, that he sleep with her. Thinking quickly, however, Joseph slid out of his cloak and ran outside. This self-control earned him the name or title Joseph the Righteous. Potiphar's wife, however, turned the tables on Joseph, and she used the cloak he left behind in haste and proceeded to tell her husband Joseph, tried to tell her husband Potiphar that Joseph tried to seduce her. Obviously, Potiphar reacted as you would expect. He blew a cork, and he took his trusted assistant and threw him into the king's prison, the pharaoh's prison. However, despite this, Joseph, Joseph's charisma followed him to prison as well, and the warden there at the prison soon appointed him as his right-hand man. The warden, too, could see that the Lord was with Joseph, and all he did and put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The Lord gave him favor, even in prison. In time, his unique qualities expressed themselves in an additional area. When the king's royal cupbearer and the baker were imprisoned, they had dreams that no one could interpret. They were under Joseph's care, and they ended up sharing those dreams with Joseph. And Joseph successfully, successfully interpreted their dreams, correctly predicting that the cupbearer would be released and the baker would be hanged. And it did come to pass. And the one caveat to this, when the cupbearer was released, Joseph asked him, because he did interpret his, his, his dreams, that the cupbearer would remember him in time and share this with the, with the Pharaoh so that he could seek his release. However, two years passed. The cupbearer basically forgot. And King Pharaoh himself envisioned two dreams. He had two dreams, which none of his advisors were able to explain. And it was at this time that the cupbearer remembered the Hebrew youth from his prison days. And the cupbearer suggested that Joseph be summoned from the prison. Now, let's stop right there. I want to share a small point that needs to be elaborated upon. From the time Joseph was sold out by his brother until two years after interpreting the dreams of the cupbearer and the baker now facing Pharaoh, 13 years had passed. So now Joseph is 30 years old and he's now going to interpret Pharaoh's dreams as being a divine prediction for seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine and advised Pharaoh to prepare by storing grain during the first seven years. And impressed by this, and this is awesome, God is with Joseph. He's favoring Joseph once again. Impressed by Joseph's wisdom, Pharaoh appointed him as his viceroy, which is a prime minister, which is second only to the king himself, and tasked him with readying his nation or that nation for the years of famine. And during the famine, Joseph had to make key decisions. His acquisition of grain provisions enabled Egypt to withstand and survive the famine. So, here was Joseph at 17 years old with his family out in the desert, a shepherd's herding, and 
he's sold by his brothers, taken into, at the age of 17, taken to Egypt, where he ends up working for Potiphar. And then he ends up being uh, taken advantage of and set up and thrown into prison. And 13 years passes. So now the dude's 30 years old. And now his, he's able to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh at the age of 30. Okay? And during this time, the next 14 years, is seven years of plenty, where he helps make all kinds of key decisions in preparing the nation of Egypt for the upcoming famine. And just as he interpreted Pharaoh's dream, seven years later, the famine hits. And then he's able to use the grain that they had saved and put in these huge silos throughout Egypt and able to still feed the nation of Egypt and provide for the nation of Egypt in that time of turmoil, in that, in that disaster that was hitting this nation, mind you. And there's so much more dynamics and depth of this story. I want to encourage you, don't just take my word for it and my Reader's Digest version of this. Take time after you read this or hear this message today. Go to your Bible. See if it's on your cell phone, your smartphone, or your physical Bible itself. Go back to the very first book in the Bible, the book of Genesis, and read how Joseph rose from being a shepherd to being the second most powerful man in the nation of Egypt, in the country of Egypt. I mean, can you, can you fathom that? You know, being thrown into prison, being set up, being thrown into prison, spending 13 years in prison, and then, you know, ultimately coming to see Pharaoh, and as a result of what your integrity, your character, the fact that you remain steadfast, that you found favor in the eyes of both Pharaoh, and, I'm sorry, Potiphar, the, the prison warden, and now Pharaoh, they all could see that the Lord's favor was on Joseph. And they honored that and put in, putting him in a position of power that ultimately ended up benefiting each and every one of them and the entire nation of Egypt. I mean, it's an awesome, awesome story. And there's examples of that even today in today's modern context. Oh, but... Ultimately, during this time, as the, fa the famine is hitting the nation of Egypt, and all the outer lying countries and outer lying areas are being affected, and they're running out of food, they're running out of provisions, and they ultimately, J Joseph's family, Jacob and all his 11 brothers, ended up coming to the nation of Egypt. Now, the cool part of this, that, to kind of wrap this up in a nice great big ball, is Joseph's brothers, per Jacob's uh, commission to send them to Egypt to go and seek to sell some things and obtain some grain so they could survive, they ended up ultimately coming before Joseph. And they didn't recognize their brother. Because mind you, when the last time that Joseph's brother saw him, he was only 17 years old. He was just a young man. He was a well-built, handsome Hebrew youth. He hadn't even grown a, a beard yet. So here he is. 30 some years later and here or uh, all these years later and he now has a full beard and he's a full grown man he's in, dressed uh, in Egyptian uh, clothing and whatnot and he's the second most powerful person in Egypt and they did not recognize him and you know if you read this the story of, of Joseph uh, he has them come in they don't recognize him that he sets them up with some food and provisions, sends them on their way, but he also sets them up by putting a gold a cup in one of their bags of food. And they come to realize that. They end up going back to, to you know, uh, get more grain and whatnot and confessed about the cup. And he ends up holding them in the leaves, you know. And the story goes on. Ultimately, Joseph opened up to his brothers and shared, I am your brother. And he shared with them, and they were united. They were united, and they ended up bringing Jacob and his entire family into Egypt. And the Bible tells us that Pharaoh allowed Joseph to bring J Jacob and his family to Egypt, where he took care of them. Now, mind you, 
Joseph ended up ruling Egypt for a total of 80 years until his death at the age of 110. So, and, and the cool part of the story is, is Joseph ended up telling his brothers, it's not you that sent me to Egypt. It wasn't you. It was God that ordained his steps, that he would come to Egypt and be where he is that day to lead a nation out of a great catastrophe. God blessed him. God blessed his family. Joseph recognized it. He didn't take credit for nothing. He gave it glory to all to God. Amen. He knew it was by God's divine hand that he is or he was where he was at. Amen. Oh, it's, it's a wonderful story. Like I said, it reads like a great novel, you know. It's got so many different components and key points. Amen. I read, ironically, another point of fact you might find interesting is this. After appointing Joseph as the viceroy of Egypt, Pharaoh gave him a wife, and that wife was Asenath, which was the daughter of Potiphar Pharaoh, the priest of On, which many are saying is Potiphar himself. So ironically, <laughs> Potiphar's daughter ended up becoming Joseph's wife. So I thought that was a relative twist of events here. You know, I thought that was pretty cool. So, and you got to remember, Potiphar was Joseph's previous master. You know, and you're going to remember that Joseph, or, uh, Potiphar's wife tried to seduce Joseph. Anyway, and long story short, Joseph ended up with Potiphar's daughter as his wife. And as a result, Joseph and Asenath had two, Asenath had two sons, which was Manasseh and Ephraim, and both were born during the seven years of plenty. And before Jacob's death, he gave Joseph a gift. His children would be the only ones from among Jacob's grandsons to be treated as independent tribes of Israel. Indeed, throughout the Jews' journey to the desert of the twelve tribes of Israel, Manasseh and Ephraim received equal status to the other tribes and they inherited individual portions of the land of Israel. And you can learn more about the 12 tribes of Israel in the book of, uh, oh, help me out here, Jephro, what, where, what, where, we're reading this, uh, in the book of Joshua. Uh, my men's Bible study is talking about that, and these are some of the things it talks about in the book of Joshua. is about the 12 tribes of in, uh, Israel and the lands that they were appointed and given, including, in this case, Ephraim, and who was the other one? Uh, Manasseh. Now, with all this being said, I want to point out, now that we have a handle on the life of Joseph, let's break it down and, and point out eight key qualities of Joseph. Number one, he was principled. He had character and integrity. He was honest. He was tempted at multiple times. And he resisted. Number two, he was humble. The power and prestige of his position working for the Pharaoh never changed him. He maintained his status quo. He kept doing all he could to the glory of God. Number three, he was disciplined. Joseph had the proper long-term perspective, even while in jail, or in prison in this case, for a crime that he didn't commit. Number four, faithfulness. While in jail... And throughout all of his turmoil, Joseph remained faithful to God and never wavered from his commitment to follow him. And number five, grace. Joseph showed grace and mercy to his brothers, even though they had sold him into slavery. I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, can you imagine being your, your family selling you into slavery? I mean, would you be able to extend grace to them after all that you've been through? And yet, this man of God had found favor in the eyes of the Lord, showed grace even unto, unto his family, regardless of all these things, because he knew God's hand was in all of this. Number six, competence. He did his job with excellence, whether as a servant or the interpreter of Pharaoh's dreams or as the manager of the family's sheep flock. Everything he did, he did it to his fullest abilities with all his competence. And number seven, Joseph was wise. He was wise beyond his years. He was 30 when he stepped in to help set up Egypt for the famine and demonstrated a seasoned perspective with decision after decision. 
I mean, you imagine the pressure, the stress, the anxiety I would have if I had to go before the president and set up a plan to save a nation for the next, to prepare a nation for the next 14 years. No pressure here, you know. <laughs> So they had seven years to prepare, and then they had seven years to kind of sit back and allow things to happen, and they would be taken care of. Number eight, Joseph was a planner. He was strategic. That's the eighth point. He instructed the officials to prepare for a famine, and even though it was years away, gathering up food to store up, and even during the years of plenty. Now, some other takeaways from this message. Ultimately, no matter the situation or the circumstances, I have to ask this. Where do you stand with God? And I'm, I know we all have our own problems, our own issues, our own dramas that we have to deal with. And it's okay to be angry or bitter about our troubles and the situations we're faced with for a season or for a little while. However, is God still your focus? Are you seeking out the Father in the times of turmoil? Are, are you living in your own strength? Or are you relying on and trusting in God to deliver you and to help you to move on? It's okay to, 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 to wallow in, in self-pity sometimes, but then you got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Keep your eyes and your focus upon God. God rely upon Him and trust Him to deliver you and, and deliver you from that situation, those, those, those circumstances. I see so many people that get so depressed dealing with the situations and circumstances they encounter, and they never grow from it. They continue to stay in that condition for the longest of time, much to their uh, uh, detriment. Whereas if they get their eyes back up on Father God, start relying upon Him and trust upon Him, he would grow them from those experiences. Use those experiences through them to help others. You see where I'm going with this. You know, just like Joseph, you know, he, he could have been bitter. He could have been angry because his brother sold him into slavery. And he, he could have been bitter and angry because he was thrown into prison for something he didn't do. When he could have fully, he could have fully taken advantage of Potiphar's wife and she would have never found that or he would have never, he would have never found out. Maybe, I don't know, you know, wallowing in those situations, knowing full well that's not where we belong. We need to stand up in the righteousness of God and move forth in Him, trusting in Him, relying in Him to deliver us from our situations, our circumstances. Even COVID-19, regardless of what's going on in the world today, we're not to wallow in that or to have self-pity. We're to pull our bootstraps up and say, you know what? God's going to get us through this. He's going to, I'm going to rely on God. God has provided for me and my family. I know he can provide for you and yours, and your friends, your co-workers. Give, share that hope, that peace, that message of comfort with your co-workers, your families, your friends, those you encounter out on the streets or out in the world. Share that message of hope, that light of hope and peace. Amen? We're not to wallow, or I know I'm saying this word wallow, but oftentimes that's how I look at it. We get caught up in our own, woe is me, you know, or it sucks, my life sucks, you know. Uh, it only sucks because you're allowing it to, you know. You know what, I mean, there's a term that says suck it up. You know, I hate to, I'm not being hard here, I'm just telling you the way I see it. How I think God just wants us to see this, it says, suck it up, it's all good, I got your back. I'm going to get you through this. It's all good. Trust in me. There's greater things to come. You think things are bad now? You think that the world's in a state now that's unredeemable? Oh, no. You ain't seen nothing yet. It's going to get worse. But praise God. If you've read the book of the Revelations, you see, it looks like the devil's winning. and He's going to take over and destroy the entire world. But you know what? God wins. In the end, God is the winner here. The saints of God are the winners here. That God is redeeming those in the world. He's saving those that are calling out upon his name. Amen? I'm telling you, God's got greater things in store for you, folks. All you got to do is reach out to him and find out what they are. Amen? <laughs> 
Oh my gosh. Do what's pleasing to God regardless of the consequences. No matter how bad it got for Joseph, God protected him in the midst of troubles and even prospered him. He had favor from God. You are a child of God. Therefore, you have favor. Amen. God wants to redeem you. He wants to pull you out of your situations and circumstances and prosper you. Amen. Ah. Oh. It was a good message. If anything, I'm getting something out of it today, and I'm praising God for it. Oh, goodness, I need a handkerchief. Ah. Relying on God's guidance will help you prepare for the future, for the future just as it did Joseph. Therefore, be a diligent, productive worker. Oh, goodness. For the Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10, a man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. And whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Amen? God is good. I mean, there's the word right there. There's the word of the day for you. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. I commit you, I, I challenge you to commit this to memory. This one scripture. It'll get you through those trials and troubles. Rely upon the word of God. Rely upon God. Plant those seeds of faith. The, that scripture in your mind, in your heart. And believe upon it. Stand upon it. Trust God for it. God's going to deliver us. He's going to get us through it, and he's going to bless us. Amen? And we're going to see a harvest we ain't never seen before. I want you to remember also that Joseph was promoted and blessed. Even in the worst of situations, he was still promoted and blessed from the lowest of states to the highest of states. Remember, he became the second most powerful man in the nation of Egypt. And we must run from sin at all costs, as tempting as it is. Say, get behind me, Satan. Don't allow sin to become a part of your life. Avoid it at all costs. Run from it. Flee from it if you must. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 15, it says this, And forgiveness should always be extended even years after the injury. Because it says this in Matthew 6, 15, But if you do not forgive others your sins, your father will not forgive your sins. I mean, look at Joseph, his example. I mean, his was an extreme example, yet he still found forgiveness and found favor ultimately in the eyes of God, as did his family and those that heard him. Amen? I mean, what a wonderful lesson right there. God is sovereign over the most darkest moments of our lives. He is the light of our lives. Amen. Colossians 3, verses 23 through 24 says this. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. And 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18 says this. Though outwardly we're wasting away, Yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory <clears throat> that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9-10, through 10, and I'm wrapping up here, it says, But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest upon me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. With all this being said, I, I have two questions to ask you. What will the story of your life reveal 
when we reach the end of each of our roads and stand before God. What will your life have revealed? Number two, what mark will you leave in this life? What legacy will you leave behind? What will people remember you for or about? What will they remember about your life? What mark will you have made? You know, I remember going on a, uh, to a biker uh, rally, a biker get-together at, at a place in Columbus called Leave a Mark. And it shows a biker's, you know, their, their logo was a, and still is, is a biker on a motorcycle doing a burnout and leaving a skid mark, leaving a mark on this life. You know, what, when God says, let's take a look at your life, what does your life reveal? Is it a life, we all go through hardness and, and, and turmoil and uh, difficulties, amen? But how did we come from those? How did we handle those situations? What people did we impact? Was it for good? Was it for bad? You know, uh, the works as a result of trusting in God. What did it yield? You know, what mark did you leave in this life? In closing, I'd like to say this. Failure happens. How you handle it decides your path to success. Amen? I don't know about you, but despite my failures, my shortcomings, I'm still trusting on God to take me to the next level that I'm going to learn from those experiences, from those failures, and grow from those. We can stay in those conditions, or we can move forward trusting in God to build us up and take us to the next level. Amen? Uh, there are so many wonderful examples in history. You know, I mean, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Einstein, uh, um, and so on, Thomas Edison, uh, you know, and the, 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 the failures that they had and how they didn't give up. They continued on and made wonderful accomplishments and left marks on this life that people remember for eons, for generations, for years. Amen? So, failure happens. How you handle it will decide your path to success. Or in the example we gave about the story of Joseph, ask yourself, WWJD, what would Joseph do? Or, as most of us know it as, what would Jesus do? Amen? What would Jesus do in, this, in these situations? Let's close in prayer. And let's consider all that God is doing in your life and mine. And, and all those that we come into contact on a daily basis. Amen? Let's lift up in prayer those that are in far worse shape than we are. As a nation, we are so blessed beyond measure. Regardless of what is going on, we still are truly a prosperous and blessed nation. Regardless of the situations, the circumstances, the politics, the calamities, God's still in control. And there's a lot more cool things about to happen. Amen. All right, Father God, I just thank you, Lord, for this message today. I thank you. You planted a strong word in me today, Father God, to be able to share that I am blessed just to hear this word today, Father God. I just pray that you'd bless each and every person that is tuned in to this message. All that are tuned in right now, Father God, that's hearing your word, that they would be blessed. That this word would weigh on their conscience. Your word would weigh on their conscience. That they're blessed beyond measure regardless of their situations or circumstances or what's going on around us. That all we need to do is take a stand, give it to you, and proclaim the power in your name. The name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And to claim the blood for the forgiveness of sin, for redemption and salvation, for hope and peace and grace. Thank you, Lord. Oh, mm, Lord, you are good. And I thank you, Lord, that you're blessing this body. I thank you, Lord, that you've allowed us to be able to open on Tuesday nights, to be able to share your word, to have break bread with our brothers and friend, uh, neighbors and sisters in the community, to be able to share with them, to be able to minister with them, and to be able to disciple them, and to be prepared to go out into the world and disciple others and share the love of Jesus Christ, Father God. So I just pray that you'd strengthen us up, Give us wisdom beyond understanding. Give us dreams and visions of greater things, Father God. And direct our paths, Father, we ask in your blessed name. I pray that you bless the leadership of this church. 
I pray that you'd bless the body of this church and all those therein. I pray that you'd meet the needs, the financial needs, the physical needs, the physical healings, the physical touch. I pray that you'd be intimate with us, Father, and bless us in special ways uniquely. And just bless the body of Christ that we'd be able to go forth and share your love into a lost and dying world. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm not done yet, so don't leave just yet. We want to know if you have any prayer requests. So leave your comments in the leave your let us know in the comments below. Drop us some emojis telling us whether you like the message or you didn't like the message. Or if you have you want to add to it, you know, share with us. Share a special word with us. If you have a yay God, we want to know about that too. And lastly, yes, we are open on Tuesday nights. And I'm gonna say it again. We're open on Tuesday nights. The doors open at six o'clock. Wear a mask, come and hang out with us, be fed here, some great music and a wonderful message. Amen. I hope to see you all on Tuesday. God bless and have a most wonderful, restful, and peaceful Sunday. Amen, and go out into the world.